Hello, everyone, and welcome to another Q&A video on our own devices. I'm Jean Messier, and a month ago, I asked you to submit your questions or suggestions for potential video topics, and you certainly delivered. I have a lot to get through in this video, but first, just a couple of things to note. First, if your question doesn't show up in this video, it's probably because you submitted it in the comments of the original video and didn't send it to the email address that I provided. Uh, I get a lot of different comments on all of my videos every single day, and it's really hard to keep up with them. So if there is a question that you'd really like answered, just send it to the email address. It's going to show up on the bottom of the screen here, and I will get to it right away. Second, so I don't keep you in suspense for the entire video, the winner of the question or topic contest is Mr. Fred Blonder. Mr. Blonder volunteers doing restoration work aboard the NS Savannah. Now, if you're not familiar with this, the NS Savannah was a nuclear-powered cargo ship that was built in the late 1950s as part of President Eisenhower's Adams for Peace initiative. And so from 1962 to 1972, it sailed all around the world, promoting the peaceful use of nuclear energy. It's an absolutely gorgeous ship. It's very futuristic. All of the fittings are retro 1950s nuclear-themed. Very, very cool. And currently, it resides at Pier 13 in Baltimore, Maryland, where it is being slowly decontaminated for not only radioactive materials, but also asbestos. And unfortunately, once it is decontaminated, there is a very real chance that it will be scrapped because no organization has yet stepped up to maintain the ship as a museum. And so Mr. Blonder is trying to arrange for me to travel to Baltimore and film a video aboard the ship, which will be important for preserving this very precariously placed piece of nuclear history. So very much looking forward to that. Thank you so much, Mr. Blonder, and congratulations. And finally, I had also announced that I was looking for an assistant to help proofread and fact check my videos before they're published. And I'm happy to announce I found the ideal candidate. Congratulations to Mr. Julian Horn. Now, for everybody else who submitted applications, uh, you have a whole wide range of areas of expertise. And so I'm going to be keeping all of your information on file. And if I need to draw upon that expertise for a particular video, I will definitely be giving you a shout. So you'll probably be hearing from me at some point in the near future. Right. So let me take a little sip of Benedictine. Perfect holiday drink. It's very sweet and spicy. Mm. Very good. And let's get on with the questions. So Emily C. writes, I was curious if your intro song was a reference to a bugle call, or is it an original song? I guess you're referencing the intro I had for the Cabinet of Curiosities segment. That's actually the first movement of pictures at an exhibition by Modeste Mozorsky, specifically the Maurice Ravel orchestration. This dates from the early days of my channel when most of my content was voiceover documentaries and I was just starting to experiment with the Cabinet of Curiosities format, actually looking at real artifacts on screen. But now that all of my content is of that format, I decided that it didn't make sense to have two intros, so I reverted back to my old generic Our Own Devices intro. And the music in that is Danse Macabre by Camille Saint-Saëns, and I chose that because A, it's a piece of music I really like, and B, I thought it would make for a suitably dramatic and punchy opening. So, excellent question. Thank you for that. Tonkatsu writes, Is it common for museums to deactivate, permanently or temporarily, firearms, vehicles, guns, materiel, airplanes, or I suppose even naval vessels, in their collections, on display or otherwise? I'm trying to settle a debate I'm having within an online community. Having watched a great number of Forgotten Weapons videos and also see an arsenal videos, it is my suspicion that the vast majority of museums attempt to preserve such historical objects without permanent alteration, mostly doing so when legally required to. I'm curious to know what your experiences on the matter have been. Also, I rather like your collection of neckwear. Thank you. Thank you for producing the videos that you do. I find them informative and entertaining. I wish you the best of luck in your endeavors. Well, that is an excellent question, Tonkatsu, and yes, one that I have a little bit of experience with. Now, I can't speak as to what happens with American museums. I would imagine this is regulated on a state-by-state -state basis. But here in Canada, museums actually have a written exemption from the Firearms Act. So just as a general summary, in Canada, firearms are regulated according to the 1995 Firearms Act, which divides firearms into four basic categories. Non-restricted, which is long guns, shotguns, basically hunting rifles. Restricted, which is mainly handguns. Prohibited, which is firearms that most people can't own. Uh, Short-barreled pistols, automatic weapons, things like that. 
Although the RCMP, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, who are in charge of enforcing firearms laws nationally, can change the definition of a particular firearm, whether it is restricted, uh, non-restricted, or prohibited, essentially on a whim. And then finally, there are antique firearms, which are firearms manufactured before 1898, which have uh, antique features, so muzzle loaders or rimfire weapons, things like that. And in order to possess firearms in Canada, you need your Possession and Acquisition License, or PAL. And this comes in two basic flavors. Non-restricted, where you can only own non-restricted firearms, such as rifles and shotguns. Restricted, where you can own uh, handguns and things like that. And a few people have a prohibited license. And these are all people who owned what are now considered prohibited firearms before the 1995 Act came into force as they were grandfathered in, and they are few and far in between, and quickly disappearing. Now, given all that, museums have a special exemption from the Firearms Act. And I can actually read you the legislation here. A business other than a carrier is eligible to hold a license that authorizes the possession of prohibited weapons, restricted weapons, prohibited devices, or prohibited ammunition only if every employee of a business who, in the course of duties of employment, handles or would handle any of those things is eligible under sections 5 and 6 to hold a license, exception for museums. Subsection 3 does not apply in respect of an employee of a museum. A, who in the course of duties of employment handles or would handle only firearms that are designed or intended to exactly resemble or to resemble with near precision antique firearms and has been trained to handle or use such a firearm. Or B, who is designated by name by provincial minister. So if you are the employee of a museum that collects and displays firearms, you do not necessarily need to have your own firearms license. Rather, the museum is issued a license and you can be designated specifically by a provincial minister in order to handle firearms. And this exempts you from criminal prosecution. So, for example, section 117.09 paragraph 5 of the criminal code provides an exemption for individuals who are employed by museums and are handling firearms as part of their duties. The section states that an employee of a museum, as defined by the Firearms Act, who possesses or transfers a firearm in the course of their employment, is not guilty of any offense under the criminal code or the Firearms Act. However, this exemption only applies if the individual has been designated by name by a provincial minister. The section is an important provision that allows museums to safely handle and display firearms as part of their exhibits without fear of criminal prosecution. It acknowledges that museums have a legitimate reason for possessing firearms and allows trained employees to handle and transfer them without breaking the law. The exception also helps to preserve Canada's cultural and historical heritage by allowing museums to continue to display firearms used in historical events or by important historical figures. And practically speaking, this means that museums are allowed to collect, store, and display prohibited firearms that ordinary private citizens are not able to. And so if we look at Regulation SOR 98-210, a business other than a museum may display a restricted firearm or a prohibited firearm only if it A, is unloaded, B, is rendered inoperable by means of a secure locking device, C, is displayed in a locked display case or cabinet, D, is not displayed in a store window, and E, in the case of a prohibited firearm other than a prohibited handgun, is displayed in a location that is easily accessible only to the owner or an employee of the business. A museum may display a restricted firearm or prohibited firearm only if it is A, unloaded, and B, is displayed under security measures that are equal or superior to those set out in paragraphs 1B to D, and in the case of a prohibited firearm other than a prohibited handgun, paragraph 1E, that are approved in writing by the chief firearms officer of the province in which the museum carries on business. So what this further means is that museums can not only collect, store, and display prohibited firearms, but also they are not required to permanently deactivate them as a private citizen would. And in most of the museums that I've dealt with, what they'll typically do is remove a vital component such as the firing pin and lock it away somewhere else in the museum. This is considered to be adequate temporary uh, disabling of a firearm as per the law. Now, the situation, of course, is very different when a firearm is being displayed outside in a public area. Say if you're a museum that has artillery pieces or heavy machine guns displayed on its lawn, there you actually do need to permanently deactivate that particular weapon by welding shut the action or welding a rod into the barrel, etc. Because, of course, if somebody were to gain access to these and try to steal them, well, then they wouldn't be able to reactivate them. So 
excellent question. I hope that I answered that adequately. Uh, again, this is a, an area that I have a little bit of experience in. Right, so moving on, Griswold Fantasia, awesome name, writes, Samuel Morse's telegraph was invented in 1844. The first electrical generators were developed sometime in the 1870s or 1880s. What powered telegraphs in the interval? The U.S. Civil War used telegraphs. Westerns are full of shots of telegraph operators. Not a single one ever shows what powered them. It must have been batteries, but what did they look like? How were they recharged? Dry or wet chemicals, probably. Or did railroads ship them? Were they ordinary goods found in proverbial general stores of the day? Uh, yes, they were indeed powered by batteries. And in fact, the first major developments in battery technology were made largely in service of the new telegraph industry, as well as for scientific investigation. And one of the first batteries to become basically standard in the telegraph industry was the Danielle cell. And this was invented by John Danielle in 1836. And it consisted of a cylindrical device with a zinc anode, a copper cathode, and a twin electrolyte consisting of sulfuric acid or zinc sulfate with a porous barrier of unfired pottery separating them. And the idea here was that the copper sulfate would consume the hydrogen that was given off by earlier battery designs. And interestingly, in 1881, the Danielle cell was used as the first standard for defining the volt as the unit of electrical potential. Now, in the 1840s, a gentleman named William Grove invented a more powerful version of the Danielle cell called the Grove cell. And this had a zinc anode, a platinum cathode, and twin electrolytes consisting of nitric and sulfuric acid, again separated by a pottery barrier. While this was more powerful than the Danielle cell, it had a nasty habit of emitting noxious nitric oxide fumes. Now, in 1841, the famous chemist Robert Bunsen of Bunsen Burner fame came up with yet another improvement on the Grove cell in which he replaced the expensive platinum with compressed carbon. And then finally, in the 1860s, a Frenchman by the name of Calou, and I don't know his first name, apparently it has been lost to history, invented yet another improvement on the Danielle cell called the gravity or crowfoot cell. And this had a zinc anode at the top with a distinctive crowfoot shape, a similarly shaped copper cathode at the bottom, and the bottom of the jar was filled with a copper sulfate solution, and the top with a layer of battery oil. And that oil was there to prevent the zinc from dissolving and plating itself onto the copper, which would have fouled the battery. So, this is a very brief overview of some of the earliest cells that were used in telegraphy, but it just shows that there is a huge amount of fascinating history and chemistry to be covered. And if I ever come across actual examples of these types of cells, I will definitely do a video on those. So another excellent question. Right, so that does it for the questions. We're now moving on to topic suggestions. And like I said, that contest was won by Fred Blonder, who in addition to the NS Savannah, suggested a number of other interesting things that I should check out in Baltimore, including a working linotype machine. So linotype machines are a type of typesetting machine that were used in newspaper offices for around 100 years, and they are absolutely fascinating. And I've covered briefly the history of these in a video on Today I Found Out, but I've always wanted to have a look at a working linotype machine. The way that these things operate is absolutely fascinating. So that's definitely something to check out in Baltimore. Another thing he suggested was to check out his brother's house, which has original gas lighting. And indeed, household lighting is something I've wanted to cover, so definitely. And then finally, something called the Baltimore Steam Machine Gun, which just sounds awesome. So apparently lots to see in Baltimore, so I'm really looking forward to making that trip, seeing what the city has to offer, and bringing that to you, my viewers. Anyways, let's move on. Bill Turner writes, In one of your YouTube videos, I noticed a CMP truck. I haven't found a video on the important vehicles of Canadian manufacture. Have you considered these as a subject? Not really. Although I have covered a lot of military subjects, I don't really consider this to be a military history channel. I'll cover military subjects when they represent an interesting application of a certain technology or an interesting solution to a particular problem. But when it comes to just covering vehicles or general equipment and things like that, that's a little bit outside my wheelhouse. But who knows, maybe in the future, I'll expand my horizons a little bit and I'll cover more generic topics like that. But still interesting suggestion. Uh, Rye H writes, Hi, I've been a longtime viewer and subscriber to your YouTube channel, Our Own Devices, and I noticed they have not yet covered the topic of reel-to-reel -reel tape recorders. Being a channel that seems to cover these sorts of items, I figured that I would make a suggestion about it. 
If you are interested, I have a rather special German reel-to-reel -reel recorder in unrestored working condition made around 1962 called the Saba TK220 US. Haven't found all that much information on this particular model, which is what leads me to believe that it is rather special. I would be more than happy to loan it to you if the time arises. Uh, absolutely. I have done a bunch of other videos on various recording media, including phonographs and wire recorders. So yeah, I definitely should do reel-to-reel -reel recorders. So I actually have a small little reporter size unit from the 1960s. And if you send me your example, I might be able to get a couple of other examples together and cover that topic. Really great suggestion. So Ethan writes, hello, first, I love your beard and glasses. Super handsome. Thank you, Ethan. Second, I watched your Taukrete episode. Great explanations. Curious, do you have a scuba certification slash have you ever been scuba diving either open circuit or a rebreather? Uh, yes, I actually did have my scuba certification, but I've since let it lapse because I haven't had many opportunities to go diving in the past couple of years. But I do intend to recertify. I absolutely love diving. And although I've only done open circuit diving so far, I would love to do uh, rebreather diving just for the technical novelty of it. So Jeremy Fox writes, have you thought about covering the Orenda, especially the Iroquois jet engines? <laughs> this is actually pretty funny. Uh, I graduated in aerospace engineering with a specialization in aerospace propulsion, and yet I have not really covered jet engines on this channel, so I will have to correct that. And if you're not aware, Arenda was a Canadian jet engine manufacturer, and probably their best product, their most famous product, was the Iroquois engine, which was meant to power the Avro Aero, the high-speed, high-altitude interceptor developed at the end of the 1950s that was unfortunately cancelled by the Canadian government. And I'm aware of two Iroquois engines that survive. Uh, one is at the Warplane Heritage Centre in Hamilton, Ontario, and the other is at the National Aviation Museum in Ottawa. So if I ever go back to Ottawa, I will definitely check those out. When it comes to regular Orenda engines, I remember there was a cross-sectioned example in one of the engineering buildings at my alma mater, which was Carleton University in Ottawa. So if I go to Ottawa, I will definitely go there and cover the history of those engines. Timothy Zatara writes, First off, I would like to let you know that your videos are extremely interesting and well-researched. I truly appreciate your effort and share your content with like-minded friends. With that said, I ran across an item I find fascinating but have found a little backstory to. The item is a self-heating solder sleeve joint that strikes like a match and burns without flame. In the limited information I have found, they were used by British SOE for demolition purposes. They are often referenced as World War II era, but I have seen some dates into the 1960s. While the operation is straightforward, the application, development, and history is where the story is hidden. I am hoping you are equally intrigued and interested in researching this further. These solder connections have proved difficult to locate, and I was able to order some from the UK. If you're interested in pursuing this story, I'd be more than happy to donate a complete box to you. So yeah, I had no idea about this until he brought it to my attention. Yeah, these are little metal sleeves with a layer of solder and sort of a match head composition on the outside. And you strike them against the box and they heat up and then they solder a set of two wires together. Yeah, if you want to send those to me, I will definitely look into it and try and do a video on that. That sounds awesome. Gary Swift writes, Hey, Jill. I'm a recent subscriber and love your historical technology content. Back in the 1980s and early 90s, I worked for Southern California Edison as an engineer at the San Onofre Nuclear Generating Station. One of the fascinating bits of SCE history I learned was about a company engineer named George Stockbridge, who developed an effective vibration damper for transmission lines back in the 1920s. Legend has it that he spent hours perched on transmission poles during storms, watching the lines with binoculars to see how they vibrated from the wind, and how his experimental devices damped out the vibration. So I actually have heard of Stockbridge dampers, and normally what I would do is go to the Electrical Museum in town where I've done a couple of videos and see if they have any in their collection. But unfortunately, that museum recently acquired a grant that allows them to interpret their own collection online themselves, and they're no longer interested in having outsiders come and do videos. So I've unfortunately lost access to that particular collection, but if I find another museum that has those dampers in their collection, I will definitely do a video on that. Great suggestion. Matt Zazik writes, Hello, I enjoyed your video on the Duke Duke knife, so I thought being a knife collector myself, I would love to see a video about Opinel knives, especially since Opinel is historically another French everyman's pocket knife, or so I thought. Uh, yes, absolutely, I will cover Opinel knives. Uh, the reaction to my knife series of videos has been overwhelmingly positive, so I will continue to cover knives so long as I can find historically interesting knives to cover. Although the next entry in that series is likely to be the Kukri, so stay tuned for that one. 
All right, Sam Copeland writes, Hello. As a possible subject, the Gray Walter Turtle robots were a very early autonomous system developed in the late 1940s. We had, the last time I looked, at least one, possibly more, very faithful working replicas, and possibly one of the originals at my place of work, Bristol Robotics Laboratory. This is, however, unfortunately in the UK, and they are probably both too large or heavy to ship to Canada, even if permission can be obtained. They have been lent out before. Yeah, I never heard about these before now. Uh, those look really cool, and yeah, if I ever go to the UK, and I do intend to go to the UK to cover a whole bunch of different things, I'll definitely try to check those out. Other possibly interesting ideas might be ecobots, robots powered by capturing and digesting flies or sewage. Yeah, very cool. Brunel, the elders' block-making equipment and production line in Chatham. Theory behind the upkeep and highball bouncing bombs, possibly also tall boy grand slam, possibly to repeat experiments with marbles conducted by Barnes Wallace. Actually, that would be really cool to set up a tank with a catapult and show how different shapes bounce over the water. Uh, yeah, I definitely want to do that. And I have covered the Tall Boy and Grand Slam bombs in a video I did for Today I Found Out on the Disney bomb, which was a rocket-powered bunker buster bomb that was inspired by a Disney animated segment. So I'll put a link to that in the description as well. Strand beasts, yeah, those are these really weird wind-powered crawling machines that were designed by a Dutch artist. And these actually have been covered in some detail by Adam Savage of Mythbusters fame. So I'll see if I can come up with a couple of videos on those and link them in the description. Vernier scales, hydraulic ram pumps, uh, copy lathes, contour shapers, and other early automatic manufacturing tools, and photoresist etching for circuit boards. Yeah, manufacturing techniques is something that I really want to look into. And if I ever find machine tools of that kind anywhere, I'll definitely cover those. And interestingly, during one of my expeditions up to northern Canada to find fallout shelters, I came across the Snow Lake Mining Museum. because a lot of really interesting mining equipment uh, on display. So I will probably head up there and try and feature some of their collection. Chris Craven writes, how about covering the history of the Curta calculator, a superb piece of mechanical engineering with an interesting backstory? Way ahead of you. Eagle-eyed viewers may have noticed I have a Curta calculator right here. And I was so happy to obtain one of these. I was looking for one for ages, but they were always too expensive. These things cost something like $3,000 on eBay. But I was at an antique sale, and there was a vendor there who was willing to negotiate down to $800 for this. So uh, I quickly snapped it up, and this is my prized possession. This is the feature of my cabinet of curiosities. So I definitely will be covering this in the future, but I do want to build my way up to it. I want to cover other uh, bulkier mechanical calculators to show the basic principles of how they work, and then finally end the series with the Curta. So please stay tuned for that. JC Wren writes, I recently discovered your channel and have been binge watching it. A wide variety of topics, all with excellent presentations and production values, with the majority of topics being of interest to me. I did a quick search and look through and I didn't see anything about the electromagnetic pulse devices. I've always found these interesting, particularly the coaxial devices. Unless I missed one you've already done, or maybe it was a tangent in an existing video like how to build nuclear weapons in the Betalite video, maybe it's a topic you'd be interested in covering. I imagine it's well within your wheelhouse based on your coverage of all things nuclear. I actually have covered electromagnetic pulse devices in a video I did for Today I Found Out, so I will link that in the description. Please enjoy. Uh, Rodney Sievald writes, Hello, Joel. Have you done anything on the history of camouflage? You could call it Fear Not Till Burnham Wood Do Come to Dunes and Dame. Uh, be very pleased to hear about your success. Uh, great Macbeth reference there. Um, just like the Canadian trucks, camouflage is something that's a bit too broad for me to cover. I'd have to cover something very specific, like I could do... Canadian uh, CADPAT digital camo, or something I've done for today I found out, is the history of dazzle camouflage, which is those really weird uh, black and white and other colored stripe schemes put on ships during the First and Second World Wars to defend them against U-boat attack. So something along those lines, camouflage is a really broad topic. I would need to focus on something uh, a little bit narrower, but I'll, I'll give that some thought. That's an interesting suggestion. Peter Levi writes, Hello, Jill. I've really enjoyed watching your channel grow over the past several months. I've posted links to some of your videos in some special interest groups where I am active. They were all well received. I'd like to suggest the first transistor as a subject for future consideration. I'm also letting you know if you'd like to obtain a scale model of it, I do make them. I use all the proper materials, brass, copper, plexiglass, gold, except for the dope chunk of germanium, which I'm unable to recreate but have simulated. If you'd like me to build one for you, just let me know. I will give you a free one if you provide a link to my Etsy shop in the description of the video and mention that they are available for purchase. I might actually have to take you up on that. 
actually wrote a video on the history of the transistor for Today I Found Out. I haven't published it yet, but I would love to do a very specific video on how that first transistor was constructed and the principles behind it. So yeah, absolutely. That sounds really cool. All right. Have a very long one here from Tom. Found your channel a few weeks ago and have been going through your videos. I particularly enjoy your presentations of message signal communications topics, especially military communications, including the video on heliography that re you released this morning. Military communications history has been an interest of mine since I was an officer in the U.S. Air Force Communications Command in the 1980s and later as a civilian working on various communication systems, most recently laser communication, a modern progeny of the heliograph. Two topics I've run across that you may wish to consider, and I'm writing about these from memories, apologies if I misstate anything. Optical telegraph networks. These are permanent semaphore stations on tops of hills, used to transmit messages very long distances in the years before the electric telegraph. I heard Napoleon had most of Europe connected and could send messages in a remarkably short amount of time. Also, there were attempts to build networks in the United States for commercial traffic. This, of course, complemented the systems on Signal Hill or Telegraph Hill in many ports, where ships could communicate important commercial information to their company's representatives in port hours before the sailing ship could dock. Having worked on microwave systems early in my career, I found it interesting that many of the same hills would likely have been used for both systems for the same reasons. I actually did a little bit of research on optical telegraph networks uh, in preparation for my heliograph video, because they were one of the examples of optical communications devices built before the advent of the heliograph. And you know, I found it rather odd that nobody had thought to use mirrors up until the 1860s. So yeah, definitely look at that. The second one is, you already covered the transatlantic telegraph cables. In the late 19th century, the US and Great Britain were the leaders in developing cable laying technology and owned custom modified or specially built cable laying ships. Therefore, most other countries contracted to them for their cables, particularly from European countries to their colonies around the world. One result of this was on, that on the eve of World War I, the British knew where the German cables were, and the first act of belligerency on the part of the British was for the Royal Navy to cut those cables. This forced the Germans to send signals to their colonies via radio telegraphy. As in World War II, the British secretly devoted a lot of resources to decrypting German signals. It turns out the Admiralty could intercept and read many of the signals sent over the air, so cutting the cables gave them a real advantage. The Germans must have suspected something because they apparently communicated with their embassies in the Americas via Swedish cables. However, since these cables went through Britain, they were monitored and the British noticed the use of German encryption. This may be the actual story of how the infamous Zimmermann telegram was intercepted. Even more interesting though, around 1916 the French needed a cable from metropolitan France to French North Africa, but the British didn't have enough resource to produce a brand new cable. So they stole the cut German cable originally running from Emden to Tenerife, picking up a portion and laying it to Casablanca. It turned out to be a bit of an adventure as the Germans figured out what was going on and were trying to torpedo the cable laying ship as it was doing its work. This was so successful that the rest of the German undersea cables were forfeit as part of the Versailles Treaty and were relayed to ports in the victorious countries. Hope these may be of interest to you, Jill. Looking forward to seeing more on your channel. Those are awesome stories. I've heard of some of them, but not others. Uh, and yeah, I definitely want to cover that. That would probably be better for a Today I Found Out video, since I usually try to focus on something where I have an artifact in hand. Uh, although I am focusing now primarily on my own channel, I do plan to write the occasional script for Today I Found Out. For example, when traffic on my channel experiences a slump or, you know, when I feel like it. So that'll make for a really good one, the cable war. And finally, Hans writes, Great videos, I've just started to watch your channel. Do you have any interest in railroad subjects? Many great things developed by the railroad, including the Westinghouse air brake, which is still in use over 120 years later. Uh, yeah, I haven't really covered any railroad subjects, but I really should. If I find a good railroad museum somewhere that I can visit, I'll definitely see what they have in their collection and try to cover some of those subjects. There's just an absolute gold mine of technological innovation there. And... Well, that pretty much does it. Thank you so much, everybody, for submitting your questions and your suggestions. I plan to do this type of video a lot more often now going forward because when I ask you to submit your questions, you really do deliver. Anyway, uh, that's all I have for you today. Uh, again, thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time on a regular video where we'll look at yet more fascinating devices, including perhaps some of the ones suggested in here. Uh, until then, I'm Jean Messier from Our Own Devices. Happy Holidays and have a great day.